And in Luke 18, uh, we see Jesus, who was always bold, right? Jesus was always bold while he was on this earth, always. But some of my favorite moments of his boldness came when he was talking with the Pharisees. More specifically, when he was calling the Pharisees out, which happened so often because the Pharisees thought that they were God's gift to the world, right? The Pharisees thought that they had it all figured out, that they were untouchable, that they could do no wrong, that they were perfect, that they were wonderful. And Jesus loved to call them out on it. He loved to call them out and say, listen, I know that you think you have it all figured out, but actually you're doing it all backwards. I know that you think you know everything, but actually you don't. Jesus loved to call the Pharisees out and he had this boldness about doing it. And, and he's doing it here in Luke 18, uh, verses nine through 14. He said, to some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, AKA the Pharisees, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Like, okay, time out. If I'm the tax collector, I'm like, what? What did I do to you? I mean, I'm just standing here because the Pharisee's like, I thank you I'm not like adulterers. I thank you I'm not like evildoers. I thank you that I'm not like these bad people. And I really thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. Like called out for no reason. Tax collector's just minding his business. Pharisee's wanting to point out the problems that the tax collector has. Because what we find it so easy to do in our lives is instead of dealing with our inner problems, with our own issues, is to point out the problems that everybody else has. Just because somebody else's problems are different than yours does not mean that you have your act together. Just because somebody has different struggles than you have, it does not mean that you are living the perfect life. The Pharisee's like, I'm thankful I'm not that tax collector. Jesus is like, whoa, okay, 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 let's take another step. Verse 12, he continued on, I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me a sinner. So you have the Pharisee who is pretending that he is God's gift to the world. And then you have the tax collector who acknowledges that he doesn't have it all together. He acknowledges that he needs some help. He acknowledges that he needs a savior. He said, Jesus said, I tell you that this man, the tax collector, rather than the other Pharisee went home justified before God for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's amazing when you actually understand what Jesus is saying here. He's saying the Pharisee who thought that he had it all figured out, the Pharisee who thought that he was living the perfect life, the Pharisee who thought that he had his act together and didn't need any help from anybody else was actually the one who was getting it all wrong. And then on the flip side, you have the tax collector who thought that he was messed up, who thought his life was in shambles, who thought that he needed help, who thought that he needed to get his act together, who thought that he needed all this mercy, and he's the one who actually did it right. See, in our lives, it's so easy for us to feel as if we are never going to struggle with pride. It is easy for us to look and be like, oh, I would never struggle with pride. And the reason it's so easy is because we walk this fine line where we know we are to be confident of who we are in Christ, but sometimes we get a little to the side of being confident in ourself. There's confidence in Christ, and then there is pride. And pride comes into play whenever we begin to tell people how good we are or how much we've done. And sometimes we'll even try to code it like, oh yeah, God is so good that I was able to do this. Like, let me talk about the goodness of God so that I can brag about myself, so that I can have a prideful moment without feeling guilty about it, 
so that I can just talk about how good God is. But the truth is, I really believe I could have done it without him. And we would never admit that, and we would never say that, but inside, that's how we truly feel. So we like to think, oh, I don't have pride. I would never struggle with pride. Everybody else struggles with pride. I saw your Facebook post, your Instagram post. I saw you talking about what was happening in your life. I saw you talking about how you finally landed the man of your dreams because you think it's really because of your looks, right? But really, it's because of the grace of God because that's the only reason it happened. I'm just saying. I know that's the only reason I landed Nicole, okay? I'm just being honest. The grace of God is real. But, but we think everybody else struggles with pride, but we would never struggle with pride. And coincidentally enough, that in and of itself is a prideful thought. To think, oh, I would never struggle with this. Everyone else struggles with it. And the reality, though, is that it is very simple and very easy for us to get into a place where we end up looking down on everybody else and forget that we need grace ourselves. Especially in church. It is very easy for us to get to a point where we unknowingly sometimes look down on other people because they don't have it as together as we think that we do. And we're able to look down on them. It is easy to get caught up in pretending that we have our act together, to pretend as if we are doing it all right, to pretend as if we have it all figured out. And most of the time, we're not doing it in a malicious way. We really do think we're doing all the right things. I'm doing all these good things. Look at my accolades. I read through the whole Bible in one year. I was in church, like not online, like I was in church. My body was actually in church. You know how next level that is right now? To actually be in church, that's like, wow. It was good, right? We feel that way, right? And so we get caught up in thinking that we're doing all these good things, doing all the right things. But the reality is our heart is wrong and our motives are wrong and they end up undoing every good thing that we've done. And the truth of the matter is Jesus knows. See, you can fool everybody. You can fool me. You can fool your friends, you can fool your family, you can fool everybody, but you cannot fool Jesus because he sees what's going on in here. He sees what's going on behind the scenes. He sees why you do what you do. I see what you do. Your friends see what you do. Your spouse sees what you do, but he sees why you do what you do, which is why it's better to just be honest in the first place. Just be honest with them in the first place. So this morning, uh, for week three of parables, I want to talk to you on the subject, if I'm being honest. If I'm being honest. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today, and I thank you now that we have the opportunity and the moment and this time to gather together. Pray that you would help us to be able to silence the noise around us, the things that we may be facing when we leave this place today. And I pray that you would help us to focus on what you have to say to our hearts. Not what you have to say to who we pretend to be, but to what you have to say to our hearts this morning. Pray that you would help nobody to see or hear from me, but that they would only see and hear from you. Speak to us as only you can. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Now, all of us here, all of us online, we, we all have a TV show or something that we're a little embarrassed that we watch or that we're into, right? Like we have something that we, we probably would not really tell other people that we watch, okay? Like it's like a like guilty pleasure or whatever, like something that we don't really want anybody else to know because we're just embarrassed about it. We, can't, we don't want people to know. And this is especially true for men sometimes, I think, because like we'll admit that we watch action films. We'll admit that we watch sports but we won't admit that we watched a romantic comedy and liked it. We, we won't admit that we watched like the Real Housewives of Atlanta or that we watched The Bachelor 
or that we watched 90 Day Fiance. We won't admit that we cried during the Lion King, right? Like we won't do the, I'm not saying I did, but some men. We won't admit that we do these things, right? Like we, we want to just kind of pretend like, oh, yeah, no, like that stuff's whatever. But it happens, okay? There are things that we watch that we're a little embarrassed and we don't want to tell. We're not going to go brag to other people about it, okay? And most of the time this happens because we have a significant other or somebody who we want to be a significant other who watches those things. And we want to spend time with them. We want to be with them. And this is what they want to watch. So we're like, okay, cool. I'll watch it with you. And then they fall asleep. And you knew they fell asleep. But to make yourself feel better because you're still watching, you pretend as if you didn't know that they fell asleep. And I'm just watching this for my person, right? I'm just watching this for them. But the reality is you got hooked, right? You got sucked into it. You got hook, line, and sinker. Nobody Is nobody going to be honest with me this morning? I'm the only one. Thank you. One show of hand. Thank you. Okay. Thank, the notebook. My goodness, yes. Man, I love when you're here, Eric. There's, there's things that we watch that, that we would never really want to admit, right? And so I, I know this is so true because for Nicole and I, when we were started dating, she was watching The Bachelor every week. Bachelor, Bachelorette, like she loved them. She watched them every week. Now, this is six, seven years ago. We haven't watched it in a long time, honestly. But back six, seven years ago, she was watching it every week. Why? Because she was a single lady, okay? And she was wanting to see love. Like she's just like wanting to see this. And because I'm a hopeless romantic, I was like, you know what? I'm going to watch this with you. I'm going to watch this with you. And I watched it with her at first to make fun of it. Okay, not in a mean way. I wasn't making fun of the people. I'm just like making fun of the process. Okay, because you got 27 individuals who want a faithful person that is dating 27 individuals. I'm like, what am I watching right now? Like, this is crazy. Like, hey, can we put our relationship on hold? I'm going to go. I'm just kidding. I'm I'm not going to go on The Bachelor. But I'm just saying, like, this is crazy to me. I don't understand how they're able to do this, how they're able to pull this off. This is nuts. This is like, it's blowing my mind. And so we're watching this, and then I realized I was getting a little invested, like a little too invested. And I realized it because I was watching it, and there was this, this lady, and she's talking about how, like, all these things she had been through, all the pain, all the heartache, all this stuff that she had been through. And she's pouring her heart out, and she's, like, telling him, you know what? But like with you, all that pain goes away. Oh man, that's amazing. And then he dumped her. Because he was like, I just can't get there. I can't get where you're at. Like, God. And Nicole looks over at me and she says, Are you crying? He's like, no, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a fake, like, this show's stupid, right? This is dumb. <laughs> this is craziness. And then we got married, and it didn't get any better, because then we got married, and now she has me on this other show. Because, see, I still like spending time with her. We've been married for almost six years, been together for uh, seven. I love spending time with her. Like, I really do. Like, it's, it's a little bit like I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to be clingy, but we're married, so you got no choice. Like, I love spending time with her. So when she wants to watch something, I'm going to watch it with her. And she's got me on this show now where these people, it's a dating show, where they don't see each other, okay? And they're in these things called pods. And I'm not going to give the name of the show, because if you haven't seen it, you're going to Google it, and you're going to judge me. So I'm just telling you, they're in these things called pods, and there's 10 of them, like 10 people, and they date around. You go into each pod thing, and you're talking to a different person every time, right? And you have like 10 days to develop a relationship strong enough to propose, without ever seeing them. Like, it it could be your mom in there, but you're proposing. Like, you don't know. And so they never see them. They're talking through the wall. They're dating all these people. And then they literally get down on one knee and propose and then boo-hoo as if they've been together waiting for this moment for three years. It blows my mind. I looked at Nicole last night, and I was like, you wouldn't have cried if I said all that to you. After 10 days, she was like, no, I wouldn't have. Because, like, what is going on, right? And then 
they leave there, they get to see each other to see if they really, you know, like, is love truly blind? Hint, hint. And it's like, is love blind? Like, so they see each other, then they get whisked away to this vacation, then they get to hang out together, and they have three weeks to build a strong enough relationship to get married. In three weeks, after not even seeing each other for 10 days, proposing, it blows my mind. Anyways, y'all pray for me. This is what we watch. But we're, we don't always watch worship music. We don't always watch other pastors preaching. Sometimes, you know, we just watch it like we just veg out a little bit and watch some craziness go on TV. I'm just saying. But the other day, like we were in the first season of it, and I'm watching, and there's this guy who was from Georgia. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to pull for this guy. I'm a hometown guy. Like, except for the University of Georgia, I pull for the hometown. So I'm watching, and I'm like, I'm going to pull for this guy. Like, he's from Georgia, right? And I want him to do well. And he's in this pod talking to this girl, and he's saying all the right things. He's making her laugh. I mean, she is cracking up. He's making her laugh. He's telling her how he feels about her. He's saying, I'm talking about their future, saying, hey, I think I want to marry you. And I'm like, that's my guy. Get it. He's from Georgia. Later found out every single contestant was from Georgia. Did not know that at the time. But I'm like, this guy's from Georgia. He's doing great. And I looked over at Nicole and I said, man, this is a great guy right here. Like, he's doing a great job. Until he went into the pod with another lady and another lady. And he said the same exact thing to both of them that he had said to the first one. And I was like, my, 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 my man, like, you're on TV. Like, even if you bamboozle one of these, she's going to see it. Like, do you understand that everything you're saying to all of them, they're going to see it play out on TV? Like, you said all these good things. Please don't undo the good. Right? Please don't undo all the good things that you said and did by saying it to the same person. But have you ever realized how easy it is in our lives to undo the good? How easy it is in our lives to undo the good things? That's the first thing I want you to see is don't undo the good. It is so easy in our lives to undo good things. We can do all the right things for years and then in one moment undo all of it. And the reason that this happens 99% of the time is because whenever we did whatever we did, our heart or our motives were not pure. So then it is not sustainable because the heart behind it or the motive behind it was pure. Hear me, your heart and your motive will always shine more clear than what you do. It will always come out eventually. You can bamboozle me for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, I don't care. But at the end of the day, your heart and your motives are going to come out. And it will undo the good that you've done in your life. Don't undo the good. Tell somebody, don't undo the good. Verse 11, it said, the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I get. Essentially, what the the Pharisee did here is he did all the right things with the wrong heart. He said all the right things. He did all the right things, but he did it with the wrong heart. What he did was not the problem, but the heart behind it was. What he did was not wrong. What he did was actually good, right? He said, listen, man, I I, I fast, I pray. Like, these are good things. He said, I do all these good things, but the motive behind it, the heart behind it was bad. And Pharisees were notorious for this. They were notorious for doing things that looked good to religion, They looked good by religious standards, and this Pharisee was no different. This Pharisee did all of the right things. He said, listen, I fast, I pray, I give, I read scripture. All of those things that he did were good. Not a single problem with fasting, not a single problem with giving, with with prayer, with reading scripture. All of these are good things. They're all good things. And I want you to really grasp that this morning. I want to emphasize that to you because I need you to understand just because something is bad does not mean that it looks bad. Just because something looks good does not mean that it is good. 
It may look good. It may feel good. It may look right. But it's really wrong. It may look like, man, I'm crushing it. I'm doing all the things that I'm supposed to be doing. I am checking every box in the Christian scope. I am the best. I wore a suit. I was dressed better than the pastor today. Not hard to do here. I was, I was prepared. I read the scripture after I left. Did all these things great. So wonderful. Look at me. It is so easy to do all of this stuff. And to put up all of our accolades, but just because you do all those things doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it good. By religion standards, this Pharisee was doing everything that he was supposed to do. He was doing everything right. He had dotted every I. He had crossed every T. This Pharisee had his act together. But at the end of the day, that's all that it was, was an act. Because there was nothing sincere about what he was doing. He wasn't doing it to point to God. He was doing it to point to himself. Everything that he was doing was to make himself look good. Every choice that he made, every word that he spoke, every decision, it was to make himself look good. It was to make himself feel good. And all of these good things that he did, all of these accolades and accomplishments and things that he had done, all of that stuff was completely undone by the heart behind which he did it. Out of the pride and out of the arrogance. Pride and arrogance undid every single thing that the Pharisee did. He came in, did the right thing, but the pride and arrogance undid all of it because he wasn't trying to point to God. He was trying to point to himself. And listen, Jesus sees the bigger picture. Jesus sees behind the scenes. Jesus sees behind what you are showing everybody, and he looks at the heart. Jesus looks at the heart. You may be able to impress everybody else. You may be able to impress your mom, your dad, your spouse, your boss, your friends, society, your pastor. You may be able to impress everybody else with all the things that you do, with all the things that you've accomplished. You may be able to impress everyone, but you can't impress Jesus. You cannot impress Jesus. And I know that that hurts the ego, but that's kind of the point. Because nothing that you could ever do would impress Jesus. Nothing that I could ever do would impress Jesus. He is Jesus. Like, this is Jesus. Jesus is like, man, I've already defeated death, hell, and the grave. I already came down and dwelt amongst you. And I already came down and dealt with everything you're going through and overcame it all. It's Jesus, right? You're not going to impress Jesus. Nothing you could ever say or do would impress Jesus. Nothing I could ever say or do would impress Jesus. But Jesus is not moved by what we've done. He is moved by the heart behind which we did it. He is moved by pure and sincere heart and motives. He's moved whenever we stay true. When we stay true. That's the next thing I want you to write down. Stay true. Type in the chat if you're online. Stay true. He's moved when we stay true. Because you have the Pharisee who faked perfection, and then you have the tax collector who acknowledged his imperfection. You have the Pharisee who pretended he was one way, then you have the tax collector who owned up to everything that was wrong. He, He told the truth. It said in verse number 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. He didn't tell God how good he was. He didn't say, hey, God, aren't you so lucky and blessed to have me? Am I not so wonderful? Is it not such a blessing that you have me in your life? He didn't do any of that. He said, God, Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I need mercy. Like, God, hey, I need some mercy. I don't have it all perfected. I don't have it all figured out. I need some mercy in my life. He didn't pray as if if he was a gift to God. He prayed as if he needed the gift of God. He prayed, God, I need you. I don't have it all figured out. God is not looking for your perfect self. He's looking for your honest self. 
He's looking for your true self. He's looking for you to be willing to come to him and say, God, I, I want to do right. I want to get this right. I want to make the right decision. I want to do the right thing, but I need some help. I need some mercy. He's not looking for us to come and to say, hey, God, I did this today. God, I did that today. God, I did this. In fact, we should make it a habit. Instead of praying, God, look at what I've done, we should say, God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you, for what I, thank you for what I've been able to do because of you. Not thankful for what I've accomplished, but God, I thank you for what you've done in my life. And I don't always get it right, and I'm not pretending that I do, but I do try to make it a point in every time I'm praying to say, God, I thank you for everything. God, I thank you for all of it. Because without you, I wouldn't have any of it. And I'm going to say something as gently as I feel like the Holy Spirit will allow me to. If you've been following Jesus for 10 years, 20 years, 70 years, you still need him just as much as somebody who's been following him for 70 seconds. At no point in your life do you reach a level where you no longer need Jesus. At no point in your life do you reach a level where you no longer need mercy. Next Sunday, we have water baptism. Going to go down, come back up. Changed person. Guess what? You still need Jesus at no point. And if you are here or you're watching online and you've ever had somebody look down on you or shame you because you were trying to figure it out, can I say that I'm sorry? Like on behalf of the global church, of all followers of Jesus, I'm sorry. Because it is not our job to look at people who are being honest about things that they are going through and to shame them and to guilt them and to tell them all the things that they've done wrong and to put them down. It is our responsibility to help build them up. It's not our responsibility to say you need this, 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 all these things are wrong. It's our responsibility to help build them up, to build them up. And many of us, we wonder why people turn to drugs and alcohol and relationships and sin and all these things, whatever it may be, to try to find the solution and the answer to the problems in their lives. Like, man, what? But the sad, difficult truth is that many of them have already come to church looking for the answer, looking for somebody who would relate to them and point them to Jesus But instead, all they found were people who pretended as if they were better than them and as if they no longer needed Jesus. As if they had it all figured out. You never reach a point where you no longer need Jesus. You never reach a point where you are better than him, where you are greater than that need of mercy. You got to stay true to yourself and who he has called you to be. You gotta stay true. You gotta stay true and say, God, I need your mercy. I need your help. Stay true to who you are. Who is that? A sinner saved by grace. Who are you? A sinner saved by grace. Who am I? A sinner saved by grace. Me, you, your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, we are all sinners saved by grace. We're all sinners saved by grace. And the tax collector, he did not come in pretending that he had it all figured out. He didn't pretend that he had no questions or no problems. And he didn't look down on those who hadn't made it yet either. He didn't look down on the ones who were still trying to figure it out, who still had questions, who were still struggling, who were still looking for answers. He didn't look down on them. And if you've been feeling your Cheerios, kind of forgetting that you need Jesus, if you've kind of been struggling to remember that you need Jesus in your life, I'm not bashing you today because we have all been there. We have all been there. All of us have been in a moment or in a time, some of us are in a moment right now, where we struggle to remember that we need Jesus just as much as the next person. Where we struggle to remember that we need grace and mercy just as much as the next person. We forget about it. But there's an easy way to remember. There's an easy way to be able to humble yourself, right? Because you don't want 
God to have to humble you. There is an easy way to remain humble. There is an easy way to be able to humble yourself in your life. And the way to humble yourself is to remain aware. Remain aware. And what I mean by that is the more aware we are of the grace that we continually need, the more able we are to show grace to others. The more aware I am of how much grace I need in my life because of everything that goes on up in here that I don't ever say. Sometimes I do say it. Pray for me. But it's like the more aware I am of all the grace I need in my life, the easier it is to extend grace to others. The more aware you remain of the grace that you need in your own life because you don't always get it right and you're not always perfect and you don't always have all the right answers and you don't always have all the right reactions and responses, the more aware you are of the grace you need, the more likely you are to extend it to others and to avoid the temptation of exalting yourself so that instead you can be exalted by God. Last thing I want you to write down is be exalted. Be exalted. Verse 14 has said, I tell you, Jesus says, this man, the tax collector, rather than the other, the Pharisee, went home justified before God for all those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is why humbling yourself never lasts. When you, this is why exalting yourself, excuse me, humbling yourself, please do that. This is why exalting yourself never lasts. Because whenever you exalt yourself, it's bound to come back down because you are human. We all make mistakes. By a show of hands, how many of you would say you made a mistake this week? So every single one of us made mistakes. If it's you in the chat, put a thumbs up if you made a mistake this week. We all make mistakes. We're all human. We're all flawed. And we all make mistakes, which is why we cannot exalt ourselves. It is not sustainable. The Pharisee tried to exalt himself. He tried to talk about all he had done, all the accolades he had, but God exalted the tax collector. He exalted the tax collector. And I promise you, and I'm saying this from experience, I promise you, you do not want to have to be humbled by God. It is always best to humble yourself. You don't want to be humbled by God. Humble yourself. Be aware of the grace that you need. Be aware of what you need God to do in your life. Because whenever you exalt yourself, then you have to sustain it. Whatever we exalt, we have to sustain. But what God exalts, he sustains. He carries it. He lifts it up. He bears the load of it. Yesterday, we, my wife and Nicole and I and our boys, we decided to go to the park. It was like such a pretty day yesterday. A little bit cold. Not terrible, though. The sun was out. So Nicole was like, why don't we you know, get out of the house? Let's go to the park. And let's go to Publix on the way and get Publix subs. I have a little picnic. I'm like, this is cool. Like, yeah, this sounds great, you know? And so we go to Publix, and the line for the Publix subs was ridiculously long. But I'm like, I guess everybody's going on a picnic. But I'm like, we're here, so it's okay. So we're in the line for the Publix subs. And we have to get some other things, like some chips, you know, to have with it and Lunchables for the boys. So Nicole said, okay, I'm going to take the boys. We're going to go get the Lunchables and chips. Lunchables, chips. That's what we're getting. That's two things. Everybody count one, two. We're going to get Lunchables. We're going to get chips. That's two things. Okay, so I'm standing in the line. It's moving very slow. Finally get to the end of the, the line after about 40 minutes, and I'm not exaggerating. It was ridiculous. Get to the end of the line. Tell the guy what I need. Oh, we don't have chicken tenders going to be 10 minutes. Well, I'm not waiting 10 more minutes, so we'll take turkey. So get our subs. Get ready to leave. Nicole and the boys are back. And they have Lunchables. They have potato chips. They have pre-made popcorn. They have, of course, yeah, they have pineapple. They have all of the, they have deodorant. <laughs> they have all these things, right? So Judah is in this stage where he's trying to prove how big he is, right? So he can lift his brother, so he lifts him up, and he thinks that's cool. He tries to talk about how he's almost as tall as I am, okay? And so he does all these things. So he's wanting to carry all this stuff. So he has, like, he had the potato chips or the popcorn, I can't remember, and the pineapple and something else, and he's trying to carry all of it. 
And then all of a sudden, he takes one step, and he looks at me, and he says, Dad, can you please carry this pineapple? I can't carry it all. And I was like, yeah, sure, no problem, man. And God spoke to me in that moment, and he said, isn't it easier to just acknowledge that you need the help? Isn't it easier just to admit that you need the help? Instead of going through life, struggling, trying to carry it all, trying to exalt yourself, trying to keep up the facade that you've been putting on, trying to keep up this look that I have it all together and I have it all figured out and I have my family and I have my job and I have our bills and I have our house and I have all of these things and I have my spiritual life and I have all this stuff and it's struggling and I'm juggling it and I'm trying to carry it all but it's a pain and I can't do it and I'm about to drop it all and it's about to all fall down and everybody's gonna see who I am. God is there and he's like, isn't it easier just to admit that you need help? Isn't it easier to just say, God, have mercy on me. I need help. I can't carry it all anymore. I can't go around with this anymore. It's all going to fall apart if you don't help me. Isn't it easier? Jesus is not looking for you to be your perfect fake self. He's looking for you to be honest. Because one thing that I've learned about God is he can't bless fake. Some of us are going through and we're carrying all these things and we're like, man, I just, I just know I know that God's gonna bless me. I know that God's gonna bless me and it'll all get better, but first I gotta push through and do all this stuff. God's up there. I cannot bless who you're pretending to be because it's not sustainable. If I bless who you're pretending to be, then you get all the glory. If I bless who you're pretending to be, then you never understand that you really do need me and it's ultimately gonna all fall apart. He can't bless fake and he's waiting on us to come to him and say, God, if I'm being honest, it's not all that right now. If I'm being honest, the big plans that I had are not sustainable. They're not working out the way that I thought they would. If I'm being honest, God, without your help, my temper is gonna keep getting out of control. God, if I'm being honest, without your help, I'm gonna struggle to remain faithful. And I've already ruined three marriages that way. God, if I'm being honest, without your help, I'm going to start trusting in somebody else rather than you. God, if I'm being honest, without your help, I'm going to stay afraid. I'm gonna stay paralyzed by fear, gripped by fear. God, if I'm being honest, I have to have you. Have mercy on me. Sure, I go to church. Sure, I pray. Sure, I read the word. Sure, I do all these things. But God, my heart hasn't been right. I've been doing all these things under false pretenses. Thought that if I gave enough, it'd get me to heaven. Thought that if I served enough, it'd get me to heaven. Thought if I knew enough scripture to quote, it would get me to heaven. If I prayed enough, it'd get me to heaven. Thought that if everybody else thought I was going to heaven, I would get to heaven. God, have mercy on me. I've been trying to do it on my own. And if I'm being honest today, I don't have any more answers. I don't have any more energy to put into the facade that I've got going. And I have to have you. 